This video is brought to you by Slate Black Industries. For grips and accessories, visit slateblackindustries.com. I'm in the captain's safe. Sir, you won't believe what I just... Hey, sir, I got this. I can talk him down. Trust me. Kakovny but Pakaru. Ha! so funny. Well, the captain thinks you are some type of a cowboy. New Paroski. Datavorish, Capitan, but you, you're a Ruskia Bakaru. Well, I'm a Texas Bakaru. So you and I, you and all. Fixing the bayonet. Casually apply his bayonet to lever action. I mean, what else are you supposed to attach to the end, Josh? That was high to the left. Okay, that first shot was a miss because I needed to establish kind of where I was. I'm aiming basically somewhere underneath the target in Nowhereville. Classic Nowhereville. Okay. All right. Impact. Oh my goodness. I would have bet money that you were gonna break it. Really? <laughs> yeah. Is it that flimsy right there? It's uh, it's pretty beat up. You also were hitting it right at the top. All right, 250. Okay, so I'm gonna start using a baseline hold for these. So unfortunately, that is a technical difficulty that you're seeing right now. Um, and it's because we used a new camera when we filmed the first run of this rifle. And the first run, unfortunately, was the best run that we did with this rifle. So I'll show a second run and actually a third and a fourth run afterwards. You know, some footage from it. Um, despite this being so frustrating to have so many runs, I'm glad that we had those runs because 
we were able to spot some issues that this rifle soon exhibited showing why it was potentially a pretty bad option for infantry to use which this was sent for infantry use in the russian empire so let's get into it and i will be here to watch the rest of this video with you all right here we go appears that it should have used the old hold uh it should be added that these sights are in arshins and not in meters so it's about 400 arshins um, is the lowest so that's uh, 300 yards or so and 280 ish meters uh, so you'll see that when we approach the 300 yard line it's actually going to be pretty nice So you can see that the 280 meter, 300 yard ish time, time you know, distance, uh, this these sites are actually pretty dead on. So fairly comparable to these days when we use 300 meter zeros on the M16. Impact. Just off the right side. Okay. Impact. Uh, so it's still fairly good. I mean, there's, there's just one miss. Impact. Good hit. Impact. Uh, just off the left. I thought elevation was workable with that. Impact. Impact. Okay, so with the 400, the 450 yard target, uh, I was aiming a little bit more on the upper thoracic and then basically using a 300 meter zero and aiming on the upper thoracic and trying to paint anything underneath. And you could see that some of the misses were actually low. Some of them were off to the left and right. Attribute that to, to a windage issue. Uh, but the first run, I mean, still the boar was relatively cool at this point. So we're still doing well. Okay, that was just off the right at two o'clock. Okay, split the difference. That was eight o'clock just off the left. I believe that was just underneath it. Yeah, five o'clock, six o'clock, just a little low on these. All right, so we're seeing hits on the up, top right, and then bottom left, and then on the bottom. So um, I think at this point, I've kind of drawn where the, uh, where the site needs to be to hit a zero impact holy cow it must have been on the left the left somewhere left edge somewhere good hit based on how hard it spun it and what josh means based on how hard it, it spun it is uh typically if there's a gong and on the gong you hit it fairly square in the center there's not a lot of leverage for the gong to to get spun one way or another um in combination to the uh projectiles being 174 grain sierra match kings for this particular one so they're fairly heavy full power 54 rim and then also hitting it on the side there's a lot more leverage to spin the gong so josh is able to identify that it seems to be hitting off to a far side of the gong, uh, more so than a center hit. Alright, that was at 4 o'clock, just off the right. 
Impact, that's it. Nice. Nice job, dude. Satisfying mine. That seemed like a quite a good run for us. Yeah, I know, yeah, it was. Okay, before you guys get upset with us for not showing enough lever action footage, which I personally enjoy as well, we were upset with the technical difficulties just as much as you are, and we ended up filming the second portion all over again to see if we could cobble together uh, two separate parts of the run. Uh, but we did not do nearly as well. Caveat to that, we actually found out one of the biggest weaknesses of this system. Now, that would be heat. One part of it translates obviously to the accuracy. With the older metallurgy, the older way of fitting your stock with the barrel bands and everything, it seemed to be really affected by heat whenever we cooked it off. Impact. Okay, so maybe when it heats up, it pushes it to the left? Yes, it seems like it. Yeah? It's getting hotter right now. I can feel it on my head. Okay, all right, let's continue. You'll see in this coming run, uh, the second the second attempt, that I actually started screwing up at the 300 yard mark. And typically I'm able to recover if, I, if the rifle doesn't have any heat issues. But it started dispersing and I couldn't find exactly where I was holding. Once I finished with that target and I let it cool down for a few minutes, it seemed to be just fine. But once we started having issues uh, with heat again, like if I missed a target multiple times, and then I would fall into this death spiral of just not being able to figure out where the previous shot, uh, how, how I could chase the previous shot. The other part of it, and pay attention on the second run, is when it heats up, that lever gets extremely difficult to cam open. Now this is less of an issue with bolt action rifles, because Mausers, uh, Mosin Nagants, etc. You'll see that they actually have a camming surface up top that you could push really hard on the bolts and it, it assists the camming of the bolt backwards and the extraction of the case. Lever actions? Not so much. You're muscling it through with a front knuckle side of your trigger hand. So... The Russians were hilarious. They ran out of rifles. They had too many men. And they ended up buying whatever they could, so they found safari rifles to convert into 54 rim. Uh, the funny thing is, I have right here, too, the Schofield revolver, which was the other standard issue Russian uh, small arm. So there is a potential, if you were a soldier running up against Russian or Baltic troops, that they would be running around with cowboy weapons in the trenches during the World War I time frame that has severe issues with heat. But I digress. Enjoy the second half. We actually have more footage because I ended up shooting this a third and a fourth time. I really wanted this to succeed, but the third and the fourth time just reinforced that it indeed does have heat issues. And, uh, but... Let's wait for the debrief to really delve into some of those observations. Much to our frustration, the camera shut off after we cleared it with very good results. So we have to start at 250 plus one shot or 250 with one hit. Impact. Uh. Okay, I'm on at three. That one got a little sticky. High by about a target and a half. Impact. High by about a target. Yeah, high. Three quarters of a target or more. High. High. In 
pack. I was at the bolt. Sorry? I was at the bolt. Okay. Impact. Impact. Okay. Just, just high on the right edge. I mean, like top. We're talking like top line of the target. Impact. Uh, same as your first shot. Top line of the target on the right edge. Impact. Let's neutralize. Impact. Hmm. That was weird. Didn't see anything on that shot. Okay, high. It's up at the bar. Okay. Okay. Uh, elevation's good. You're just off the right by maybe a third of a target. Okay. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're dealing with Mirage off the barrel, that's one thing. But the viewers are going to be able to see Mirage, um, you know, Mirage through the the optic that I'm seeing out, out down range. These Winchester casings, ironically, are sticking a little bit. All right. Just short. Good windage. Just short. That one was high at the top line of the target. I mean, that, that was uh, about a full target plus short. Impact. Okay. Okay, low by a target and a half. Okay, three o'clock, just to the right of the plate. Same spot. Impact. Just low on that last one. Just low? Yep. Ow. Okay, one more. Okay, that was high right. Two o'clock. Okay, that was nine o'clock. Blocked that last shot. Impact. All right. Done. All right. With much frustration, but we cleared the course. We'll see you guys at the debrief. I think the Russian contract Winchester model 1895 is a is an example on why lever actions really failed in the military race and why when a nation is desperate enough to buy weapons because they have more men than rifles and a company has a model that wasn't selling and has a manufacturing capacity to answer that demand they could potentially generate something that was the worst for the World War I era soldier to use in the trench. These are fairly standard World War I era type sights. Not a problem either. They're accurate. It's an accurate sighting system. It, it works in, on that aspect. Looking at the action, which is the heart of why this matters in the first place. The lever action box fed magazine was a, an elegant design by John Moses Browning. He answered the problem on tube-fed magazines because tube-fed magazines, you constantly had different weights going through uh, depending on your ammunition count. And that would affect your barrel's accuracy due to the barrel harmonics shifting. So the box-fed magazine was able to feed rimmed cartridges really easily. And a distinctive feature to the Russian contract 1895, you'll see the guide bridge for the stripper clips. It's a beautiful design, but I, I think it is a beautiful design deployed in the worst location for these things. The amount of ingress points are unreal. If you look underneath right here, 
the reason the plate drops is because you need to facilitate that full throw for the full size cartridge. The entire top is open. The entire bottom is open. And on top of that, if you are shooting corrosive ammunition, which we were for the, the third and the fourth run we went out, if you were to clean it, you'd have to take these little small screws out in order to remove the box magazine, which was a royal pain to reassemble after you disassembled it. And then you're talking about losing screws. The Mosin Nagant, on the other hand, there are no screws to lose when you take the action out. And on top of that, when the action heats it up, and, and you're supposed to really use brass ammunition on this, it started to stick. And that's why after 200 rounds at third and fourth, this motion right here on, on, the, on the base, and you see a lot of lever action guys winds the bottom part of their lever up with leather for that reason, was really getting beaten up because the action started to stick pretty badly once it started heating up. Okay, I'm on it. Three. Now, to add to that, the stock, this is a signature curve on lever action Winchesters, which is potentially very comfortable, let's say if you were in the trenches and you were shooting with a relatively upright posture, not bad. But if you're shooting prone, this really starts digging into your shoulder. And coupled with a full power recoil, I most definitely felt it when I got home. And I typically, these things, it takes a little more to affect me with recoil because I shoot full power steel butt plate, 8 millimeter Mauser, 303, 54 rim, 30 yard 6, the M1 ball type, all day long. And I did not have this type of reaction on recoil as I did with this. You'll see in some of the footage that I'm actually using the recoil, the hunting recoil pads on my shoulder, which I never do unless it's a significantly recoiling rifle. And on top of that, some guys talk about the lever action as being bad for prone. Yes, it is, but it's not as bad as you would think. I mean, yes, you elevate your head. Yes, you create more of a silhouette. I can't believe I still have these things in. Um, but it's not that terrible to sweep the base. I mean, it's still a fast action, but it's a fast action if it didn't stick. It's an accurate action if it's just for the first few rounds or the first 10, 20 rounds. Uh, past that, it just starts wandering, which is not good in combat. If you look at the Mosin-Nagan action too, as you cam the, the, the bolt open, you'll see that it assists with the camming. For this, no, it, it does not. But, as I was frustrated with the third and the fourth run because I really wanted to succeed and, and I gave it m well more runs than any other rifles that we've really shot on course because I had an illogical desire to see an antiquated system outperform all of those bolt action rifles that dominated the World War I, World War II time frame. After all that, as I was still hot and bothered, as I was still tired, I wondered, is it because I had an issue with iron sights that day? Was I just off my game? So what better to check myself with than the M16A2? See if we can get it. Ready? Yep, yep. Impact. Impact. Uh, right edge. Impact. Impact. Yeah, I'm inclined to think that it's not me with iron sights having an issue oh, no. with that rifle. No, no. Yeah. It... Sorry, guys. I. I wanted to succeed. Now what you saw was me shooting this at 300 yards. 
with open sights. After I had my shoulder ripped up by the 1895 and I shot four out of five shots, just quick and easy, no issues. S open sights as well. So I, I don't necessarily think it was me, although that wasn't very scientific and I am very familiar with the A2. I want the 1895 to succeed. I have an illogical obsession with lever actions. I think they're very cool. I think this as the first World War I and full powered lever action rifle that we've featured on the show. It is gorgeous, but unfortunately, I don't think that it is a very good infantry issued weapon. And I think there is a definitive reason why these went out of style so soon, even though the world at that point was full of countries who needed rifles to arm their men going off to the front lines. This was just simply not a very good option for that war and the wars subsequent to it. Now that being said, if you are interested in learning more about this particular rifle, I encourage you to check out Othias's uh, video at CN Arsenal on it. And I enjoyed it very much myself. And if you have an hour or so to sit down, drink a tasty beverage and learn something about a significant development in lever action history, that actually took part in fighting in the front lines, that's your show. Now, Matthias doesn't know I'm saying this, so if you're watching, surprise. Now, uh, I'd like to say a special thanks to Joseph again for loaning us this beautiful specimen. And thanks for Brandon at the gun room for hooking us up with the transfer. And um, until next time, we shall see you on the range. Subscribe to our newsletter at slateblackindustries.com where you can get updates on nine hole review publications and access the practical accuracy scoreboard to help you argue with people on the internet on which rifle performed better on the practical accuracy course. We maintain this newsletter to be majority gun content with nine hole reviews updates per every email with less than 33% marketing content. Subscribe today on slateblackindustries.com. Seven one six this is Zero Nine Six Four Vic Eight Pack Red Con One Green and Green Top Copy Over. Zero Nine Six this is Seven One Six Roger Over. One Six Zero Nine One One Pack Green Green Over. Seven One Six Roger Over. One Six Zero Nine Two One Victor Two Packs Red Con One Over.